and um, we're here to talk about drones and conservation. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris Cassie, who's one of the many incredible members of our stewardship crew, and he's just going to talk a little bit and then introduce our presenter. Take it away, Chris. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chris, and uh, I work in stewardship at uh, SHC. Um, and today I'd like to introduce to you Stephanie Long, who uh, is one of our current uh, AmeriCorps uh, stewardship and volunteer associates. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar, um, AmeriCorps is a, um, is a federal program that facilitates service um, through programs like Project Conserve. Um, and um, tends to um, essentially provide, um, you know, service for organizations like SHC with a uh, conservation objective uh, and also the um, uh, experience and skills for uh, aspiring conservation professionals. Um, and then um, stewardship at SHC, uh, maybe the uh, more under talked about program. Um, if uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with what we do, essentially, um, once we get lands protected, um, stewardship is the, uh, is the program that essentially uh, ensures that um, conservation easements are being upheld on private lands uh, and that the properties that we own outright um, are being managed in a way that uh, supports established conservation plans. Um, so in terms of a, an AmeriCorps uh, stewardship and volunteer associate day to day, uh, you'll commonly find them out on remote and rugged property boundaries, uh, you know, navigating rocks and roots and trees and barbed wire fence and all of the above. Um, uh, landowner interaction is a huge part of what we do, writing technical reports and GIS mapping and um, just to name a few. Um, all that to say is that um, we tend to find that our AmeriCorps professionals um, are also very uh, highly motivated and enthusiastic people that sort of come with their own um, unique value added uh, skill sets or bonuses, if you will. Uh, and in Stephanie's case, um, her um, expertise as a drone pilot has been highly prized at SHC over the last year. I'll let her tell you all about that. Um, so by way of a prior term of service with uh, AmeriCorps at the Vermont Land Trust and uh, originally hailing from Michigan. Stephanie Long, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. <laughs> uh, so as Chris said, I, I'm Stephanie. I'm an AmeriCorps member with uh, Project Conserve serving with SHC this year. I've been here since September and in the stewardship team and having a great time. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about drone capabilities in conservation work and how we've been using the drone for various projects at SHC this year. Uh, and so if you missed it on the screen here, it can be a little hard to see. This is the drone uh, that I'm flying here. So we're going to be talking about, uh, we'll be looking at photos and videos that I've taken that are used to help showcase some properties, recently protected properties by SHC. And um, we'll also be looking a bit at the mapping capabilities that drones have and how these maps can be used by a conservation organization like SHC. So to start it off, we're just going to look at some uh, sets of video clips. This is showing an area around two recently acquired properties, the Cold Creek Gap properties, and I'll get a bit more into that in a bit. Uh, as a bit of background, I came into this position with SHC with an interest in pursuing drone use and conservation work and continuing to learn how drones can be helpful in conservation work and useful. Uh, and the staff at SHC has been very supportive of helping me find projects where drone footage is applicable, where it's helpful. So I've been primarily working on projects for communications purposes. So I've been collecting photos and videos like we'll see here today uh, that can be shared with SHC members and the public to showcase these recently protected properties. And what we're seeing in the background of this video as well uh, is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So we're seeing these two properties that sit right next to the park and we'll get more, a bit more into them. This next property is uh, Jenkins Branch Farm. It's located about a mile from SHC's community farm in Alexander. And it's about a hundred acre property and it sits in a landscape that has other farm properties, but it's also in an area that's seeing increased development as much of Asheville and the areas around Asheville are seeing increased development. So by protecting this hundred acres of land, we have this large parcel that will stay uh, protected. And for these communications projects that I've been doing uh, with my drone, I've gone out with SHC's seasonal drone ecologist and in-house photographer, Travis Bordley, who gets credit uh, and a shout out for having the idea to go to the Cove Creek Gap properties by the Smoky Mountains 
for those sunrise and sunset shots. Uh, just some incredible lighting out there and a fun opportunity to get out there. So Travis takes photos and videos from the ground level while I go up and get the bird's eye view like what we're seeing in these videos with the drone and capture photos and videos from a perspective that we don't normally see. So we're now at the community farm in, uh, in Alexander and there are two restoration projects happening here. There's a stream restoration project and there's also a short leaf pine restoration project. Uh, and there was a prescribed burn that happened back in November to help with the shortleaf pine restoration. And if you're interested in more information about that, Travis put together a video with some of the drone footage, some of his own footage and interviews with staff and stakeholders getting into that shortleaf pine restoration project and, uh, and the prescribed burn that happened there. I think the opportunity to see these areas from a different perspective is, is one of the main advantages of using a drone. And besides being able to look at the landscape from a different vantage point, you know, cool to see it from up here in general, I think it's also really helpful to see it from this perspective because you can see how these protected properties fit into the landscape around them uh, and how they're you know, important to protect based on what's around them, whether that be more protected air land or areas that are being developed, you know, and it's important to keep some continuous, contiguous uh, protected parcels. I think this footage can also be a bit more telling than just uh, looking at a 2D map maybe. So here at the community farm we've got in the background is the uh, shortleaf pine restoration area and then to the left is the stream restoration area over here. So taking a step back for a minute, uh, just to look at the two main categories of small drones. So you know what we're talking about when we're talking about flying drones. So we have fixed wing drones and multi-rotor drones. The fixed wing drones are like the one we see here on the left. Uh, and they're really great for mapping. Um, they can fly much farther on less battery than the quadcopters can or the multi-rotors can, the drones we see to the right. So they can cover more ground during a mapping mission. And they do require more space for landing and taking off. And they're also more expensive generally. Uh, so they do kind of fit into this niche of being particularly good for mapping and getting high resolution imagery. And then on the other side, we have multi-rotor drones. So multi-rotor just means that these rotors with the propellers, there's at least two of them uh, or more than two of them on these um, on these drones lifting the drone up. So all the drones we see here on the right are considered quadcopters because they have four of those rotors. And these drones are a bit more versatile than fixed wing drones. They still have mapping capabilities, but they can also capture really stunning aerial imagery and uh, aerial videos. They come in a range of prices depending on the size, the type of camera, there are other specifications, but they generally are much more affordable than a fixed wing drone would be as well. Uh, and they can be easier to maneuver. They also don't need as much space to take off and land because they just go straight up and straight down. And so that gives you more flexibility in where you can fly and where you can take off and land from. But as I mentioned, they do use up their battery faster um, because of the different things that they can do. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind and you know, would suggest having multiple batteries with you when you go out. So I fly a Mavic 2 Pro, which is similar to this drone I have circled here. And it came out about a year ago and its battery can last for almost half an hour, which is pretty good for this type of drone. Uh, but when I go out, uh, that's about 20 minutes of flying time because you wanna have enough time to get your drone back to the ground. And you also wanna buffer just in case anything happens and you need you know, extra time to get your drone back. So when I'm going out, I usually go out with three fully charged batteries just to give myself time to get up there and, and try out different shots, different videos and photos, or be able to map for a little bit longer. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So all the photos and videos that we're seeing today when I'm talking about using a drone, I'm talking about a quadcopter and I'm specifically talking about uh, a Mavic Pro if you know more about your drones. So we'll get back here to the photos. Uh, this is a photo of Great Smoky Mountains National Park and it is right near the boundary uh, with the Cove Creek Gap properties. So the Cove Creek Gap properties are two properties that SHC recently acquired and they acquired with the intent to uh, pass them over to park ownership. So the, pretty soon the park will own those parcels. And so this photo was taken by just going up 100, 150 feet up near the boundary. Um, and this is the protected landscape that these two parcels will be adding to. The next two photos are from the community farm uh, and the community farm expansion track in Alexander. Uh, and it's where the prescribed burn happened in the fall. That area is kind of in the right of this photo. And you can also see the, the stream here in the left. That's where the stream restoration project is. I think these photos are a great example of that unique bird's eye view uh, that the drone can give us and can just show the landscape in a way that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. Uh, and I think it can also 
bring out different patterns that maybe you couldn't see from the ground. And I especially find these top down images to just be really intriguing to look at because they just look so different. You know, you're looking at the landscape in a very different way. This next photo was taken at the Hampton Creek Cove State National uh, Natural Area in Tennessee. Uh, so we're above the state natural area here and we've got Hampton Creek over to the right. And much of the forested land in the background of this photo is uh, federally protected land. And the Appalachian Trail runs along part of this ridge line up here. And then we also on the right, uh, kind of far right backside, have a parcel that was recently acquired by SHC, recently protected. It's the De Young property, and it backs right up to Cherokee National Forest. So you can see how that parcel fits into this larger landscape of protected forest land and is also uh, close to the Appalachian Trail and in some spots can be seen from the Appalachian Trail. And this takes us back to Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It's another view uh, of this area of the Smokies that's right next to uh, those Cove Creek Gap properties. And the two properties that I've been talking about, they sit right about here and they go up to the ridgeline. And then everything to the right of the ridgeline is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So I think from this vantage point, you can really see how these properties are connected to a vast area of protected land. And I think it helps showcase the value of protecting these parcels because of their vicinity to the park, because they're so close to the park. So next we're gonna get into uh, the mapping capabilities uh, that drones have. This is an ortho mosaic or an aerial photograph map of the two restoration areas I've been talking about at SHC's community farm. So you've got the stream restoration area on the right and the shortleaf pine restoration area and prescribed burn area on the left. I think drone mapping has a lot of potential for conservation work because the maps can offer high resolution imagery of a particular area. Uh, and this can be particularly helpful if you wanna document and monitor or see change over time. So an example of this would be if you do this mapping mission here that we did this year, if you were to do that annually over time, then you'd be able to go back and compare these maps to each other and see how the landscape, how the vegetation is changing based on the treatment that it's been getting. So we'll just briefly get into the program that I used to create the map. This one is drone called Drone Deploy, but there are multiple different programs you can use. Uh, I specified the area that I wanted to map over here. This is the boundary. And based on the boundary, we get these green lines. You see that's where the drone is gonna be flying. And as it's flying, it's continuously taking photos. So over on the left, we also get certain specifications based on the area that I wanna map. So it tells me how long it's gonna take, how large the area is, how many images it is, and importantly, how many batteries it will take. Uh, that gets back to the kind of lower battery life that quadcopters have. And so it's important that I'm picking an area that doesn't go over my battery capability. Uh, and you can also change the flight altitude to help with this. So if you're flying higher, your resolution is, you know, you're losing a little bit of resolution, but you do get to cover more area. So that can help you map a larger area in one go if you fly a little bit higher. And when you, when you map, so drone deploy helps it helps you set up the map, it helps you carry out the map, uh, the mapping mission, and then later put the photos together to create the map. So once I go out to fly, you can use the app and you send the drone up and the app basically controls it. And so the drone flies automatically follows this flight path and then comes back to me. And when we're talking about mapping with the drone, uh, we're talking about the drone taking a bunch of photos of a specified area based on a flight path like the one we just saw, and then the computer program will stitch those photos together. So this diagram here in the bottom is kind of an example of what's happening as the drone is moving uh, across this flight path as if it were moving, you know, left to right, it's continuously taking photos. And so the bottom of these large triangles represent the area that's photographed. And you can see here that there's a lot of overlap and that's the important part because the overlap is what's necessary for the computer to be able to uh, kind of compile those images together and create a larger image that is your map. And another way of looking at it is at the top, there's a lot of lines going on, but if you can follow the larger rectangles, each one of those represents an individual image. And then the drone is looking for this area of overlap or the, the computer program is looking for this area of overlap to be able to uh, connect the photos together and create one image. Stephanie, we have a question that um, may mm -hmm. be a good time for you to talk about if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, from Mark, it says, uh, how is satellite photography like Google Maps helpful for drone deployments? Do you have any sort of initial response to that? Yeah, I was going to get in a bit to the kind of the combination or the, the comparison between satellite imagery and uh, drone mapping, but the, the satellite imagery is extremely helpful for planning the maps. Um, so this imagery here, I think it's the same imagery that 
uh, that Google Maps use that we see on the back here. So we get to have that satellite imagery showing us the area that we want to map it. So that makes it a lot easier to be precise about the area. And then when you go in and map it, you're essentially just getting yourself uh, higher resolution imagery. But I would say being able to use satellite imagery to plan your mapping mission um, is extremely helpful. So here we're looking at uh, the same flight path that I've been talking about. And each blue dot represents um, an, a spot where a photo was taken. And so you can see that the photos were taken pretty close together because you want that high level of overlap so that it's easier for the computer um, to put those images together and create that map. So these next four photos, uh, they are just an example to show you what that overlap looks like. So they were taken right in a row. And it's helpful if you keep an eye up here on this road and watch it as it changes as the drone moves. So as the drone is moving, these are each individual images. And so the drone is taking a photo partially of an area that's already been photographed and partially of a new area. And it does that as it goes. And then the computer program can later go and stitch those images together based on the same areas that it finds. So this is one of the uh, map outputs you can get when you take all those photos and you put it back into the computer program. And this is the, the main one I think would be helpful for for monitoring and documenting some of our conservation work. Uh, so this is the same ortho map from earlier. This is looking at the two restoration areas. So this red outline represents where the prescribed burn happened uh, for this shortleaf pine restoration area. And so essentially, uh, ideally you would go and maybe every year you could use the same flight path, go the same time of year, uh, go from the same altitude, just recreate this map over time. And then you'd be able to go back and see how the vegetation is changing um, in response to the management uh, treatments that it's been getting. And programs like Drone and Fly offer other types of maps as well. So this is just another example of the map you can get with the same uh, photos and data you, that you collected. So this is an elevation map that's showing the lowest elevation is the dark blue and the highest elevation is the dark red. And another map you can get is a vegetation map. Uh, so I'm using a different example here, but I'll explain why. A vegetation map is essentially showing, it's kind of comparing vegetation within the images to see what's more healthy, what's less healthy. And it's doing that by uh, determining what's more green and what's less green. And so essentially you wanna be mapping an area that has similar or the same vegetation because it's comparing vegetation within the map to determine you know, what's more green, what's healthier and what's less healthy. So using crop maps, which is what this is. This is a, an example image from the Drone Deploy website of a crop field. Um, using these types of maps for crop fields is really common and a great use of drone mapping. It's also a great use of fixed wing drone mapping. So you can send that fixed wing map up uh, to follow a similar flight path um, as we've been looking at for the restoration areas. And it will come back with being able to create a map like this with the images it collects. And so that would help you be able to see maybe where areas are, uh, are less healthy, not doing as well, and, and you can try to mitigate that. And then the final output we can get is a 3D model. So this is a still image of part of the 3D model for those restoration areas. And I was originally thinking primarily of the uh, orthophoto as what we'd want to look at for monitoring change over time. But I do think it would be really interesting, especially on a slightly larger time scale. So maybe you know in 10 years, it would be really interesting to use this 3D model and then get a 3D model in 10 years and, and just have another way of looking at the landscape of, of trying to see how it's changed and getting some more detail and, and getting that 3D view uh, could be really interesting. But 3D modeling is particularly helpful when you are flying a drone in an area that has buildings or you're trying to map an area with buildings or inspect a building. It can be really helpful to have these 3D mapping capabilities. So one of the big reasons why you'd wanna use drone imagery to create a map versus maybe satellite imagery uh, is the resolution. So on the left here, we have satellite imagery uh, zoomed into about 50 feet above the ground of part of the restoration area we've been talking about. And it has one meter resolution. And then on the right here, we have uh, a section that's from the map that was created with the drone imagery. And we're looking at the same spot on the map and that has five centimeter resolution. So it just has much more, much higher resolution. You can just see much more in detail. But while the resolution is really good, there are limitations to uh, mapping with drones, particularly in the, in the generally forested and mountainous landscape that we're in. Um, so satellite imagery, especially satellite imagery ranging from a meter to 0.3 meters in resolution is a really great option for being able to monitor a whole property. And that's what SHC uses to uh, remotely, aerially monitor some of their protected properties. 
but the drone imagery and drone mapping can be helpful when you want to talk about more specific smaller areas. Uh, this is example being this specific restoration area that we want to look at over time. So a lot of the limitations for drone mapping come from rules that uh, pilots have to follow given out by the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, there are also some rules that the state of North Carolina has. So if you're flying a drone, commercially, if you're flying it for work, you have to have a license from both the FAA and in the state of North Carolina, you need a, a license from the state as well. Um, and so I have licenses from each of these entities to be able to fly for SAHC. Uh, and most of the rules come from the FAA. And then there's some additional rules that the state of North Carolina tax on. Uh, but the FAA rules are looking at airspace regulations and there are also drone specific rules. And one of the main rules that is also applicable to uh, kind of being limiting and their mapping capabilities is that generally speaking, you're not supposed to fly your drone more than 400 feet above you. So that's 400 feet above ground level and ground level is considered where you and the remote are. And it's easy to tell the, the remote, it gives you a lot of information about the drone while it's flying, including height. Um, and you can set it to only go a certain height. You can set it to let you know when it gets to a certain height. Uh, but generally speaking, you're supposed to be within that 400 foot range. So much of what we're seeing for the sectional chart, it's showing airspace. Uh, this is the Asheville Airport and the Smoky Mountains. And there's a lot going on in here, but most of what's going on is happening above 400 feet. But it is helpful to know what's happening in the airspace where you're operating. Um, and especially if you're trying to fly near an airport, this is the Asheville Airport. And just around here, there's specific restrictions for the airspace where you couldn't fly at all unless you have uh, specific permission. And another one of the uh, kind of limiting factors, one of the rules that you have to follow is that you have to be able to see the drone at all times with unaided vision. So that means you can't be using binoculars or have a, a partner who's using binoculars while you're flying. If you're flying, you have to be able to see it with unaided vision. Um, and, and these rules and other rules you can get around with some waivers or some specific exceptions, but generally speaking, that's what we're talking about. So when we have these, you know, glorious <laughs> forested mountainous properties um, that much of SHC's protected properties are, it can be hard to map the whole property because you'd have to get, first you'd have to get through the canopy, then you wouldn't be able to see the drone while it's above the canopy potentially. Also, if you're talking about a property where you're taking off from, uh, from lower, toward lower on the property, lower elevation, and then the property raises, you know, a thousand feet in elevation at the ridge line, then you'd be running into getting into different airspace and needing permission there. Um, so it's all to say that the satellite imagery is a really great option for, for the remote monitoring. And I think the drone imagery comes into play when you want to look at specific, uh, specific areas and really see in depth, like the restoration areas we've been talking about, or another example could be if a neighboring landowner, you know, happens to encroach and they maybe take a few trees down across the boundary on an SHC property, we could go up with the drone and get a map of that specific area. And so we can document it in really high resolution of, of just that area. So I think drone mapping can also be a helpful, um, just helpful to add additional information to what SHC already has. So we just have a couple more video clips from those Cove Creek Gap properties uh, to carry us out. But I think um, wrapping up, just to say that drones can collect a lot of information. And I think they're multifaceted tools um, that fit well in conservation, both in the examples we have here and, and in many more ways. Um, so they fit well with, with communication stories, with getting out these conservation stories, helping, helping staff and landowners, stakeholders, funders, the public in general, see these properties, see how these properties fit into their landscape and why it's important to protect them. Uh, and there are also some stewardship and management capabilities, including being able to you know, map specific areas over time and, and monitor their change over time. So now if you have any other questions, I would be happy to take them. Also, you know, if you have any suggestions of how else we could be using a drone uh, to further this conservation work, I am all ears. Uh, and also, thank you for joining us today. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. I learned so much about drones, Stephanie, thank you. We did have one question um, that came through the Q&A and it was um, how is healthy and less healthy defined when you're looking at those, the row crops, I believe, where you were showing the green and the red? Yes. Yeah, so there's a specific equation that's used, the normalized difference vegetation index, which gets into it a little bit, but essentially you can have a sensor on the drone, you can put different sensors on drones. And so you can have a sensor on that drone that's getting a certain wavelength that can tell you essentially like how green the plant is. So, you know, if you want your, you're saying that a healthy crop is a green crop. Um, so it's saying it can tell you that this area is more green than that area. And the sensor that it flies with can pick that up. Oh, 
Very, very cool. Uh, Mark had a question about visible air pollution. Um, I'm not sure really what he's asking there, but do you run into those problems with air pollution or are drones able to um, kind of get around air pollution? Yeah, I think that's a great question and just something that I haven't run into out here. I'm thinking, you know, if you were flying in other areas that have more air pollution, I think it would be a lot harder and that would make it more difficult. You probably wouldn't be able to fly as far. You can get uh, certain lighting that also helps you fly in the, the dusk and dawn time that would maybe be helpful for that. But out here, it's not an issue that I've run into so far. And the questions are flooding in now. We have, um, people are very, very interested. So I think one was asked, can you please provide the source of the restricted airspace controls? Yes, yeah, so if you go, if you just go on the Federal Aviation Administration website, the FAA, um, it will give you a list of, it's the part one of seven list is specific to, um, to what, where drones can and can't fly. And that's where you can also find sectional charts, all that information about um, airspace regulations is all through the FAA and they have all that information on their website. Another question, um, Christopher says, great stuff. Are you considering adding additional sensors to your fleet like multispectral or hyperspectral sensors to do more quantitative analysis of the health and vegetation through time? Yeah, I, I would really love to. Um, yeah, I think it depends on, on the type of work that we're doing. I did a, a project in college where we got a different a multispectral sensor and we were trying to use that vegetation index to see hemlock dieback um, in relation to the hemlock woolly adelgid in a, a large stand of hemlocks. Um, and we got partway through the project, but we really didn't get all the way through it you know, before I graduated. But I think there's a lot of potential there because you can get so low and you can get such good resolution um, that I would definitely be interested in it. I know at school we were able to get a different sensor and mount it um, with a, a mount from a different uh, company onto a DJI drone. So I think there's a lot of capability there. You are so wise, Stephanie. I, I didn't even know where to go with that question and you just answered it like, like a pro, amazing. <laughs> um, Jeff Needham um, asks, does SHC own the imagery data collected? Seems like it would be a lot of data. Is this challenging over time? Yeah, I, I guess I haven't gotten fully into the ownership. I, I think they do. You know, I share everything with SHC whenever I go out on all these properties. Um, and that is something to get into. I've been considering, you know, so going out, when I go out, I get a bunch of photos, you know, a bunch of videos and try to cut it down into more usable clips. And then uh, I'm sharing more of those clips just so that we're not clogging it up because it is a lot of data over time. Uh, and for my own personal use, I use an external hard drive to save all this data. But I think if we were to continue this with SHC, that could be a question, you know, if we're running out of space because it, it takes up a lot of space to do this. And then Mark um, wanted to know, do you see a difference in air pollution throughout the year? How much um, do you notice, notice that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we started flying in February. Um, and so we've been flying since then. So it, I haven't been out in this region all that long looking at that. Um, so I haven't noticed anything yet, but I'm glad that you're bringing this up because I hadn't thought to think about it. And so I think it's something I'm going to look into both in terms of, I think on the, maybe on the weather site, you know, you can get different pollution readings and I would love to know more about how that's affecting it. Because I do think depending on, you know, how polluted the air would be, you would run into trouble with at least being able to see the drone, if not with other things. And then Terry wants to know what are the North Carolina DOT rules for drone? And I imagine that might be on a website as well somewhere, but are there anything that maybe differs than the federal rules? Yeah, essentially it's just it's just adding on to rules. So there's specific rules that it is on the, the North Carolina DOT site, but there's specific rules about needing permission to take off and land on state owned or munis municipal land. Um, there's certain regulations. You have to be a certain distance away from correctional facilities. There's also a specific rule about hunting, both that you can't, you can't hunt from a drone, you know, you can't mount something on a drone to hunt, but also if you're in an area where people are lawfully hunting, you can't use a drone to disrupt their hunting, um, specific to North Carolina. I think there might be maybe 10 laws that are specific to it, and that gets added on to the FA laws, which are really specific about airspace in particular. Awesome. 
And then just a few more um, are about sensors. Are you referring to filters for your camera? Or are these sensors different than, than filters? These sensors are different. Um, and filters is a good question. I also uh, have been reading about filters lately and, and considering, you know, wondering if I should be getting some. But the sensors are specifically picking up different information. So instead of getting the information, you know, that we use to see these images, it's getting different wavelengths. So with a, the sensor that we use when we were trying to look at the vegetation of the hemlocks, we're using a sensor that's pulling up, I think it was using cyan and a purple color maybe. And so it's a, it's a different camera. So you wouldn't be using the images from your main camera, whereas, you know, you put your filter on your main camera, you're using a, a different sensor on a different camera. Thank you for that explanation. And just two more. Um, do you have a favorite place to fly your drone in Western North Carolina? So far, I, I feel lucky uh, to be able to go. I feel very lucky to be able to go on these protected properties that SHC is protected. Getting out to the Cove Creek Gap properties was awesome because uh, national parks, unless you have some kind of specific waiver, you can't fly drones in a national park um, for any national park in the US. And so getting the opportunity to be on a property you know, that's so close, uh, so close to the Smokies and being able to get images of the Smokies while still being in the right kind of airspace in the right spot was really cool. But in terms of public flying, um, that's something that I'm still working on looking into. I just moved here in September. And so I have questions about where you may or may not be able to fly in Pisgah Forest, because I think that would be you know a beautiful place to fly. But I haven't been out enough on public land yet, I think. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, there's so many beautiful places in Western North Carolina. That's absolutely, that's a tough one. Um, and so the last one, is there affordable drones that can fly longer than 30 minutes? Do you have any recommendations for maybe a starter drone? Um, there are definitely more affordable drones. Uh, DJI is one of the main manufacturers of these quadcopters that we're talking about. And they have a you know range and prices and abilities, but you can get a DJI mini probably for a couple hundred dollars. Um, and if you get if you get up a little bit, the DJI Mavic Air, I think it is, um, is a really great deal in terms of the camera it is and the price it is. And I think the Mavic Air goes for maybe 30 minutes, but this this 30 minute cap, um, from what I understand, is pretty standard across the board. And there are, I have read, you know, on a drone form that you can get a this like special battery that's really been vamped up, but but that's not widely available. So this 30 minute cap for now is what it's at, but DJI and other groups are continuing to come out with drones. So I think that could that could be helped. But for now, I would suggest just, you know, getting a couple extra batteries. Great. Thank you for that. Um, just a few more people. I love this. I love the conversation, the questions. Um, do you ever reimagine an area or reimage, I'm sorry, reimage an area due to any sinking error or any other error in connecting the individual images together? Yeah, so I haven't had this uh, this issue yet, and I have just started some mapping projects, but I specifically was trying to map lower to use drone deploy as a specific um, a specific program where it will change the height of the drone depending on the elevation. So the drone will always be maybe 220 feet off the ground or yeah, off the ground, but it will kind of move to make up for that. And so I think that can make up for, uh, you know, if you have problems in between images, um, but I haven't come across any issues yet. I think because I've been keeping it small and trying to really overdo with the overlap, I think, you know, 60 to 70% overlap of images. And then are there commercial companies offering drone mapping services? Yeah, so that's a good question. Definitely. Um, I, think, I think it's more probably state by state, you know, smaller groups. There are definitely groups that like surveying groups in particular that will use drone maps um, and will map for you. Um, so I would say you would have to look kind of locally or regionally for that, but it is a common thing. I think drones are used for, you know, videos and, and photography in a kind of commercial sense, but also for mapping and offering to do mapping and, and survey quality mapping. You can get certain, uh, you, can, you can really, there's a way that you can kind of lock in your GPS so that it can be survey quality. And there are companies out there that will map for you. I just want to, I think that's all the questions we, we, I just wanted to mention that we are recording this and we'll share it on our YouTube channel and on our website. As a reminder, I've put a link in the chat to our YouTube channel. This is a great place to catch up on um, some of the more kind of more extended versions of this drone footage that we talked about. 
Also a great place to check out some of our past lunch and learns. Um, and man, Stephanie, this was amazing. Thank you so much. I learned so much about drones and we are so lucky at SHC to have you as our AmeriCorps this year. This is incredible. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on the stewardship side. You're so lucky you get to work with Stephanie. <laughs> um, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation. We love putting on these lunch and learns um, just to give you a little bit of taste of what we're up to. And it's kind of nice in this new virtual world we can connect in this way. So be sure to check out our videos. Thank you again, everyone for attending. I'm seeing a few more questions popping up. Um, Michael has um, a Mavic Air and it's quite discouraging that you can't fly over national parks or state parks, including anywhere along the Blue Ridge Parkway. Yes, I can imagine that being frustrating. <laughs> you can get waivers sometimes, um, but I think you'd need a specific, yeah, you would need a specific reason for it. But I totally agree. I think that's why finding these pockets of properties that are nearby, it's like it's like a, a gold mine of sorts. And I just feel lucky to be able to find them. And so if you can find, you know, if you know people that live near these areas, that could be a way to, to try to get some images there. But I agree. Yeah. Michael, I've gotten a chance to know through the Carolina Nature's Photographer Association, and he's taken some drone footage for us out in Sandy Mush. Okay. And so thanks so much for joining us, Michael. Um, all right, well, I think that's all. Um, any final words, Stephanie, Chris? No. Nope. Uh, thank you to SHC for giving me the opportunity to, to buff up on my drone skills, to share photos and images and, and do the mapping. I think it's such a treat and yeah, I love to be doing it. And thanks to Stephanie for all that she does. We couldn't do it without you. Awesome. Well, we have a, our next Lunch and Learn will be uh, May 20th. Um, I think, I believe it's on our website, but we'll be talking about conservation easements and everything you would want to know about what they are and why we use them and how they benefit the community and landowners. So be sure to check that out. As I mentioned, all of our past videos are on our YouTube channel. Be sure to like that and subscribe to stay up to date. And I hope you all just enjoy the rest of your beautiful Tuesday. It's a gorgeous spring day here in Asheville. So everyone get outside a little bit today. So till next time, everyone, thank you.